Jefferson Starship, everybody. You know, uh, I, I did a little internet research after we decided on this song to inspire the title of this message, and all I found was like search hit after search hit after search hit that, uh, that uh, we built this city is the worst song of all time. <laughs> That's the internet's consensus. I was like, oops. But you guys are going to have to humor, humor us for a second. So take out your church programs. and the inside page, you'll find some notes. You can follow along with the message today. Uh, as Fraser just mentioned, we are finishing our series called Life's Greatest Hits. And uh, you might have a playlist that, um, uh, of songs that you would consider the greatest hits of your life or the classics that you could just put on repeat and listen to again and again and again and again. And the idea behind this series is that there are some truths and promises of God that bear repeating, that our souls need to put on repeat and be told again and again and again and again. Amen? And uh, so today's message, the title's inspired by a good old starship, we built this City. Uh, in the 6th century BC, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was constructed under the leadership and management of a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. I like to call him Old Neb. It just seems like an old uncle's name, Uncle Neb, right? And I'm referring to the hanging gardens of the great city of Babylon. And ancient writers describe them as being self-watering plains of exotic wildlife and exotic plants, reaching a height of over 75 feet. That's really big. Through a series of climbing terraces. And supposedly, King Nebi's wife missed the mountains and flowers of her homeland. And so uh, King Neb did what any good husband would do in a situ situation like that. And he's like, well, I'll just build you a mountain, right? And we can have a mountain right here. And that's what he did. And apparently it was wonderful. And uh, Babylon was no doubt the most prominent and the most powerful and probably the most resplendent city on the planet at the time. And uh, the Bible records that one day... King Nebuchadnezzar decided to take a little stroll on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon to kind of just like look on the horizon and look over everything that he constructed, everything he built, and just kind of relish in that. And a part of me can relate to that. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like how I feel after I finish assembling something from Ikea. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, I feel, I feel really good right now. Like, I, I did that, and I did it with just this little tiny Allen wrench. So, what now, right? And so, but the Bible says this, it says that when he did that, as he looked out across the city, he said, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. And almost immediately... The Bible says that while the words were still in the king's mouth, there came a voice from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom has departed from you. While the words were still in his mouth, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Essentially, what happened is, is that he lost his mind. Literally, he, he went crazy for the next seven years. God allowed him to just lose his mind, and he lived like a wild man, like a wild beast out in the middle of nowhere for seven years. And his mind and his position was finally restored when he humbled himself and he looked up to heaven and he praised God. And he prayed this. The, the, the story in Daniel, it says this, that he prayed, God, your dominion is an everlasting dominion. Your dominion is an everlasting dominion. And your kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and God, you do according to your will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay or stop your hand or say to you, what have you done? You see, King Neb had become so engrossed with what he had been building for himself that he had failed to recognize who God was and what he was building. 
He was so consumed with his own city, with his own kingdom, that he neglected what really mattered. Almighty God, his city, his kingdom. And as a result, he found out in a rather hard way that the very best of what we build for ourselves on earth is literally nothing. Literally nothing compared to what God is building. He found out the hard way that that the life we build here on earth can only have real substance, can only have real value, can only have real purpose if we make God's city, God's kingdom, our primary focus. And now, interestingly, after we read this story in the Bible in the Old Testament, after we read King Nebuchadnezzar's story, we'll notice that throughout the Bible, the city of Babylon becomes this symbol or perpetual reminder of humanity's propensity to build up our own little kingdoms while totally neglecting God's. And in the Bible, the city of Babylon, it becomes this, this icon, this representation of the city of man in our own worldly inclinations, which stands in stark contrast to the city of God and God's righteousness. And so what the, the underlying questions that we're being confronted with by God and his word is this, to which kingdom does your allegiance lie? Which city do you look to for security? Which city are you investing in? Which kingdom are you focused on building up? Which kingdom do you glory in? Which city do you take pleasure in? Your own or God's? If you look at the passage on the top of your your notes, Hebrews 13, 14, it says, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. God wants us to position and orient our lives toward the city that he is building, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So what exactly is God building? The first thing is that God is building an everlasting city. God is building an everlasting city. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, it says that it says, By faith he, meaning Abraham, by faith Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did his sons Isaac and Jacob, uh, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So if you're familiar with Abraham's story in the book of Genesis, it tells us that that God's people from the very beginning lived sort of like a nomadic life. They, They didn't have a place or a land that they could claim ownership of. They didn't have a place or land that they could call their own. They didn't really have a home. They lived in tents and they just traveled around and everywhere they went, they were just, they were just visitors. They were just travelers and visitors in a foreign land. Their, their experience of home, it lacked any real sense of permanence. And so what this is telling us is that they longed for the day that they could finally experience a home that was. Not some city that was just here today and gone tomorrow, not just a place that you pitch your tent and then you have to dig it back up again and pack up and you go on to the next place, but something permanent, something lasting. They longed for the day where they were no longer visitors, but that they could call themselves permanent residence. No more running, no more uprooting, just home. And ultimately what the author of Hebrews 11 is saying is that they were longing for the city of God because the kingdom designed and built by our awesome God, it's it's eternal, it's absolutely permanent, never-ending. There's There's no more wandering. There's no more wondering what's next. There's no more uprooting. There's no more moving around. There's no more uncertainty or insecurity about what the future may hold. In the city of God, you will finally have arrived home. 
And let me tell you something, there's, there's nothing sweeter than arriving home, is there? Especially when you've been out and about for a couple weeks or something like that, and you finally get to arrive into, to your home with the smells of your house, and maybe for some of you that's not a good thing, but my house is pretty good, all right? And, and you get to sleep in your bed, right? And uh, I mean, I can appreciate this. I'm fresh off of summer camp with our students. We went down to North Carolina, and it was a serve-based trip, and we were serving all week long, and it was hard work, but it was it was good, but we, we had to sleep at a, in the dorms of a small college. And uh, so, you know, the experience for the week is we're sleeping on a mattress that's like, you know, that wide and like that thick. And I'm sleeping in a sleeping bag that essentially like mummifies me, you know, I'm just like, I'm like this, I'm cocooned right now. And so my, that first night home, when I get home, man, it feels so good. I just plop on my big bed and I just starfish all night. You know what I mean? I just starfish. And like Lindsay, Lindsay's like, you know, like, Tim, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? I'm like, because I can, right? <laughs> I'm going to starfish all night long, get used to it, right? I'm home. God's word is reminding us that, that, that for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, God is building an everlasting city that we can truly call home. Which means, which means that the world that you are living in right now is not home. And so you shouldn't treat it like it is. The world we live in here and now is not a lasting city. Everything we see, everything we experience, everything we have is temporary. It's here today, gone tomorrow. So, so this, this passage is challenging us to start looking at our life differently. It's challenging us to change the way we think about ourselves and who we are and how we operate in this world. It's challenging us to view our lives and our time in this world through the lens and the experience of Abraham and the nomadic Israelites. This, this world is nothing more than a temporary residence for you. This world isn't home, so we shouldn't treat it that way. But you are travelers in a foreign land. In other words, don't get too comfortable here. And don't forget where you truly belong. Do you know where you truly belong? In the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 through 20, the Apostle Paul is talking about a few people who have forgotten. He says, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, and get this, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Your true citizenship lies in God's kingdom. And so what this is saying is, is let your focus, let your choices, and let your priorities reflect that. Right? So if we're going to get like practical and very specific now, like your jobs, your titles, your houses, your possessions, your education, your degrees, your projects, hobbies, businesses, and bank accounts. Hey, those are great things. You should enjoy them, but don't forget that you can't take any of them with you when you leave here. So it's not what matters most. The most important investments that you can make in this life are in things that will last and the things that will stand the test of eternity. And so what will last? What lasts? Is it power? Is it status? Is it money? Is it stuff? Is it, is it Netflix? <laughs> That'd be really sweet. But no. The Bible says that what lasts, what lasts will be, people will last. People will last. So if you want to make a wise investment and be a part of building something great, then pour your time, pour your talent, pour everything you got into the people around you. 
The Bible says that, of course, God will last and your relationship with God will last. I mean, isn't this why when Jesus was asked, hey, what is the most important thing we can be doing in this world? What's the greatest commandment? Jesus responded by saying the single greatest commandment, the single most important thing you could be doing and investing your time in is loving God with everything that you got. And the second most important thing that you could be doing in this world is loving other people because those are the only things that will last the only things that will stand the test of eternity. These are the kingdom-focused priorities. This is investing in eternal things for an eternal city. 1 Peter 2.11 reminds us, he says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Some followers of Jesus are beginning to forget that they are but temporary residents of this world. Their purpose and priorities were driven by this world. They were aiming their heart at the wrong city. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it in his book, Mere Christianity. He said this, he said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. And he goes on to say that followers of Christ who think less of the next world are among the least effective in this one. Are you aiming your heart at the city of God? What would it look like for you to adopt priorities that were driven by eternity rather than this world? What would it look like for you to begin making choices with the long view in mind, to live life with an eternal perspective, to orient your life toward the everlasting city that is to come. God is also building an indestructible city. God is also building an indestructible city. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27 and 28, it says, all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. You know, at the time that this was written, the world was dominated by the Roman Empire. Uh, The glory of Rome, as it was put, it stretched from from modern-day Syria to Scotland, and this kingdom was guarded and advanced by an impressive and unmatched military might. And the city of ancient Rome itself was the largest city the world had ever seen. At its height, it it counted uh, around one million inhabitants. And to just put that into perspective of how gigantic that is, especially for its time, more than 17 centuries would pass before another urban area contained as many people. And that's London. Rome introduced democracy to the world. They built Aqueducts that carried water 70 miles into the city, just incredible feats of engineering. They constructed a Colosseum that could hold 65,000 people. No big deal. Its monuments and temples stunned visitors, and its culture and values were exported throughout its vast empire. It was, in the days of the early Christians, referred to as the Eternal City. This is the eternal city. The common belief at the time was that regardless of what happened in the world, no matter how many empires came, no no matter how many empires collapsed, the strength, the beauty, the quality, the integrity, the glory of Rome would endure. It was indestructible. And so you can just imagine, just imagine how controversial something like this passage, passage would have been at that time. It's not just challenging that idea, that opinion. It's challenging where someone's loyalty stood. Believers in Jesus were looking at the glory of Rome, the city of man, square in the face, saying there is an indestructible city, but guess what? This isn't it. And they were right. I mean, you can go and pay 30 bucks and tour its ruins today. 
history has proven that when it comes to strength, when it comes to beauty, when it comes to quality and the value of things in this world, it all follows an unavoidable and unstoppable trajectory toward decline and decay. So not only are things in this world temporary, but even while they last, they slide along this path from strength to weakness, from new to to old, from fresh to spoiled, from innovative to outdated, from interesting to mundane. Even the biggest and even the best things in this world wear out and they fall apart over time. But But the city of God isn't bound by the same kind of fate. Hebrews 12 tells us that that only that which is unshakable will remain. So so while the kingdom of God is eternal, it is everlasting, it is made up of things that cannot fade. It is comprised of things that cannot diminish or vanish or fail or wear out over time. And what this means is that the strength and the beauty and the majesty and the glory of God's kingdom will remain absolutely unbroken and unfaltering for eternity, for all time. I mean, can you imagine each moment you spend in the eternal city of God will be more beautiful than the last, each experience more breathtaking than the last, each day more magnificent than the last. The more you see, the more you do, the more you experience, the longer you're there, the more you will be undone by the majesty and glory and perfection and unparalleled grandeur of our God and his eternal kingdom. It will never become old news, ever. And what's more, is that the city of God will not just be filled with imperishable things, but with imperishable people. 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25 says this. It says, for you have been born again, not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, People are like grass, and their beauty is like the flower in the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Another translation of this verse says, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So in the kingdom of God, as, as, you, as you spend your time in the glory of the kingdom of God, your health cannot deteriorate over time. Your mind cannot slip over time. Your memories cannot fade over time. Your strength cannot fail over time. Your beauty, uh, assuming that you are indeed beautiful, will not diminish over time. Come on, have a sense of humor. The brutal truth is that all of us here in this room are in the process of dying. It's a depressing thought but every single one of you are closer to death and decay now than you were when I started this message. (laughs) It's true. But in the city of our God, you will be released from this death spiral. And you will be as new tomorrow as you were the day before. Your existence for all eternity will be entirely swallowed up by new life and glory. If we look back at our passage from Hebrews 12, 27 and 28, it says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us then be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. The truths that we are talking about right now, it should impact our life in this way, that we should live a life that is full of gratitude. We should be thankful. We should live our life in gratitude and humility and worship because God chose to save us from this death spiral. He chose to save us and pluck us out from this trajectory of death and decay that our world is on. Right, think about this. When he shakes all creation, which he will, we could have, and I think deserve to be shaken along with it. But that's not what God chose to do. That is not the fate that God has for you. By grace through Jesus Christ, 
God will make you a permanent and perfect and enduring creation of his everlasting city. God is building an indestructible city. God is also building a preeminent city. He is building a preeminent city, a entirely perfect city. I love the picture we get from Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 through 4. This is the Apostle John when he's uh, well-seasoned in age. He's towards the end of his life, and, and he receives this vision from God uh, uh, for the, the city that God is preparing for us. It says, I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And get this, I love this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. And neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away, for the former things have passed away, for the former things have passed away. The kingdom of God is in every shape and form better than the world that we now know. Because at the heart of it, it rectifies every single broken component that exists as a result of the fall. One commentator of the Bible I read put it this way. He he said this, and I loved it. He said that the fall has overthrown the true dignity of man. The fall has overthrown the true dignity of man. Humanity and the world that we live in has been altogether disfigured by sinful inclinations and evil, and hatred, and misery. And I, it's not to say that there aren't many, many, many good components of this world and of this life. There absolutely are. There are many things to celebrate. There are many things that bring us joy. There are many gifts from God here and now in this life. But we have to face the reality that we have also become a people terrorized by fear, crushed by injustice, plagued by pain and anguish and overcome by death. And that's a problem. And what's interesting is that we we work so hard in life to just accept this reality, to just accept it. We train our kids from a young age by telling them, man, life is hard, get used to it. Life is unfair, suck it up. This is the way it is. And when we sit at the funeral of a loved one, when our relationships break apart, when we are crippled by depression, when we receive a terrible diagnosis and that bad news, when we are overwhelmed by guilt and shame, when we hear yet another story in the news of of some despicable and senseless act of violence, when we are cut down, mistreated, abused, and used, we sometimes tell ourselves, well, this is just the way it is. I got to just accept it and swallow this pill. But I think when those things occur in our life, deep down inside, I think most of us have a nagging suspicion that this just isn't the way it's supposed to be. We can't escape this feeling that this just doesn't feel right. Now, the problem is that if you don't interpret this feeling through a relationship with Jesus Christ in his word, you will have no idea why you're feeling that way, nor what the solution is, or what right actually looks like, or what it's supposed to be, if there was a right. But for those of us who know God, for those of us who walk with Jesus, we not only know for a fact that the world isn't supposed to be this way, but more importantly, we know that soon enough God will set all things right and that the former things will pass away. And we know what it will look like because God has told us. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1-4, through 4, He describes this unsettled feeling we get. He says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, though, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will 
not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. You see, when we start walking with Jesus, we can walk with a confidence that the broken world we live in is not God's end game for us. That the pain you experience right now is not God's end game for you. We walk with the confidence that the anguish or the misery or whatever challenges you are finishing or, or going through will not have the last word over your life. We know that the day is coming when he will rectify and restore and renew everything. And we know and believe that the fear and the shame that terrorizes you will give way to endless joy and delight, that the injustice and violence that harasses you will give way to unbroken peace and love. The cycles, the habits, the addictions that trap you will give way to freedom, holiness, cleanness, eternal healing, and the pain and agony and misery that plagues you, it will no longer exist. That's why we sing. That's why in Christianity we sing and we praise God and we have joy. We don't need to walk around drab and and depressed and, and crushed by rules and laws. We sing. God has accomplished this for us. It's coming. And we can walk with the confidence that it is. The death that overcomes us all will be swallowed up by life. And it's so important to preach this. It's so important for us to be talking about the preeminent city that is to come because because I think partly we need to not just praise God for it and be grateful and, and sing hallelujah, but we also need to level set our expectations for our life in this world. You know, one of the questions I've heard many times over the years is that why does God allow such pain and suffering and evil in this world. If Jesus came and he indeed conquered the devil, if he indeed conquered death, if he indeed conquered evil and sin, why are things still so bad here? It's a great question. And while I don't intend to explore the complexities of why bad and painful things occur, I will say this, is that God's ultimate plan was never to turn this world into paradise. God's ultimate plan is to prepare something altogether new. That's why the great city and the kingdom of God is often referred to in scripture as the new heaven, as the new earth, as the new Jerusalem. So Jesus Christ, he he came here not to fix up this temporary broken world of ours. He came and suffered for our sins to bring us safely home to God. He came to ensure our position in the city of God as permanent citizens. So we need to understand that this world will never live up to the expectations of heaven and the standards of heaven. It won't ever be and can't ever be free from the pain and brokenness and misery that we see and experience in life. But rather we live by the hope and the eager anticipation that all of this is only temporary and it won't last. But what's amazing is I love what Fraser said earlier this morning is that even in those moments of challenges and hardships that it's not a single bit of it is wasted. So it's not just about hunkering down and and, and just surviving and just let's just get through it. But God is even bringing purpose and meaning in the midst of it. No matter how bad things are, no matter how bad things will get in your life, you can take heart and have real hope that your faith in Jesus Christ is propelling you toward an eternal glory that will far outweigh it all. And God knows that the difficulty and challenges of your life very well make each day feel like a year. But I'm telling you that the moment you are embraced by your King Jesus in that great city of God, you will look back on all the years of your life on this earth and it will seem as but a day. And I'm telling you, we will be there before you know it. God is building a preeminent city. And lastly, he is building a united city. God is building a united city. 
If we look back to our passage in Revelation 21, 1 through 3, it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. The crown jewel of the city of God is God himself. The greatest gift God has prepared for you in his city isn't everlasting life. The greatest gift he has prepared for you in his kingdom is not freedom. It is not health. It is not happiness. It is not pleasure. It is not gold streets and crowns of glory. The greatest gift God has prepared for you in his kingdom is himself. Far above any other purpose, God has built his city for relationship with you, for intimacy, for love, for presence, for perfect worship, and now, of course, we, we talk about having a relationship with God all the time, here and now, right? So I think it's worth talking about what exactly this means, how things will be different, how that relationship might change. If you look at Revelation 21, verse 22 and 23, it says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb, who is Jesus, is its lamp. So in ancient Israel, the temple functioned as a point of contact between people and God, right? The, the temple in, in Jerusalem was where God dwelled. It was where God's people, the Israelites, could, could approach him and, and offer sacrifices and offerings and worship him. And the temple provided humanity a way to communicate to God, to encounter God. But the vision that we've been given through Revelation 21 is of a city where there are no need for temples. There are no need for intermediaries, right? So we'll be able to do away with all the symbols and all the sacraments and all the ordinance in our worship because we, now we will be face-to-face -face with the real thing, right? The kind of worship that we experience now will be superseded by uninterrupted and unbroken relationship with God forever. And this passage says this, it says, the city does not need sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. It's kind of like when you're in a dimly lit or dark room, you need a flashlight to find your way around. But once you step outside into the daylight, you, you toss the flashlight aside. You don't need it. It's, it's redundant. In the same way, while we are in this world, we rely on our faith in Jesus. We hold on tight to our hope in God. And as we navigate the dark places of this present life, it is through our faith and through our hope that the light of God breaks through. But there is coming a time where you will no longer have any need for the faith that you fight for and struggle with or the hope that you strive to hang on to because it will give way to immediate and direct and undiluted face-to-face -face communion with the majesty and splendor of the King of Kings. You will know what it is to live united with the perfect and permanent presence of God. This is the purpose. This is the meaning behind it all. To know God and to be known by God. This is why God sent his son here to this world to die for you, to suffer for you. It's because of love. He wanted to be united with you forever. Couldn't bear the thought of living without you. This is our God. Band, I would love for you to join me back on stage. The everlasting, the indestructible, the preeminent kingdom of God is a kingdom of and for perfect relationship with him. Jesus says in Matthew 6, he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. 
It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and his righteousness, and he will give you everything you need. Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God needs to be number one in your life. It needs to be first priority in your life. Jesus is saying that when you make God's kingdom your primary focus in life, your primary object of desire, when your purpose and your priorities are driven by what God is building, everything else in your life here and now will fall into its proper place. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. To which city is your heart pointed? Where's your home? Where do you claim citizenship? Maybe you're here this morning and you're hearing about Jesus for the very first time. Maybe you're hearing about this kingdom for the very first time, or maybe you've heard it tons of times before, dozens of times before, but this morning, for some reason, you're hearing about this King Jesus and this kingdom that he has built and prepared for you, and it's just hitting you in a whole new way, and you're thinking to yourself, I need to be there. That's my home. You know that feeling of homesickness you get? When you're away from home for too long, can't wait to get home. I just wanna be home, I wanna be where I belong, I wanna be in my place, I wanna be in my environment, I wanna be where I belong. And even sometimes when you're, you're in a place that you've lived all your, all your life, you can think back to your childhood and you're stirred with feelings of nostalgia and you feel unsettled. You're like, oh, those are the good old days. It's like this homesickness, right? I believe that God has put that in our hearts for a purpose. That's a taste of heaven in your heart to remind you that this isn't your home. I want to be where I belong. God, I want to be home with you. That's where I want to be. And if that's where you're at this morning, guess what? Your eternal destination can be determined now. You don't need to go through classes first. You don't need to like sign some document first. It doesn't need to be approved of by the elders and pastors of this church. There's no admission fee. Even if you feel like you're entirely unqualified for such a stunning, beautiful, perfect kingdom. Jesus says, it doesn't matter, just come. I got you covered. I'll vouch for you. When we show up to the gates of the kingdom of heaven, I'll turn to everyone and say, he's with me. She's with me, we're coming in. Open up the gates. I have paid the admission fee, the cost is covered. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what lands you've traveled. It doesn't matter where you've pitched your tents. The search is over. God's got you covered. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that you have prepared for us a kingdom, a city, a home, far beyond what we could ever deserve or qualify for, but nonetheless, out of your love and your grace for us, you have made a way for us to spend forever eternity with you and your kingdom. God, your word says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Thank you, Jesus. And if you're ready to say yes to Jesus this morning, if you're ready to say yes to his kingdom this morning, you just need to say this prayer. God, I recognize that I need you. I've sinned against you, but I believe that you've covered the cost for every single sin I've committed, past, present, and future. 
and I confess Jesus as my Lord, as my Savior, and I want to spend forever with you and that my real home is with you. Help us, God, to position and orient our hearts towards your city. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We praise him.